Hi guys, it's Chad Larson with MLD Wealth. Um, welcome to another episode of MLD Wealth Money Matters. Um, a lot to get through today. Um, here we are entering into the back half of the year. Uh, so half the year is over. Um, want to revisit kind of what our outlook was from January. It's always nice to go back and and take stock of you know what the viewpoints were, what our um, beliefs were going into this calendar year, and then to see how things have gone. So. Going back to the start of the year in our January uh, market outlook, you know, we expected the markets to be very choppy in the front half of the year and to be more constructive into the back half of the year um, as the market started to discount and pay forward for the eventual recovery that we see in 2024. So six months in, markets have been very choppy. There has been pockets of calamity, pockets of outperformance, pockets of gross underperformance, and you know, continuing a, a news cycle narrative in and around uh, a lot of whether it be geopolitical, monetary, or fiscal, or things happening within the economy that are uh, driving significant volatility still in the marketplace. Um, so one of the things we're going to address four things. Um, it's going to be long, but hopefully you're listening to this while you're driving. Um, we're going to talk about investor fatigue uh, first off. Uh, talking about uh, a segment that we call the anatomy of a narrow market. Um, I'm going to talk about inflation and the cooling economy and what we expect. Um, and then talking about the disparity between uh, value and growth investing. Um, so kicking it off, I want to discuss the topic that many investors are experiencing in these challenging markets, and that's investor fatigue. So by addressing exactly what investor fatigue means in the context of a challenging market, Investor fatigue refers to the weariness or exhaustion that investors may experience during periods of market turbulence and prolonged uncertainty. It's the feeling of being emotionally drained by the constant ups and downs of the market and associated stress that comes with it. Some of the comments and questions that we're receiving are, um, you know, like, you know, should I just buy all GICs? Well, this is probably the first time we've seen G, uh, GIC re rates, um, you know, north of 5% in a very, very long time. Um, six uh, in some cases. Well, based on tax rates in Canada being predominantly 50% or better, um, your net real return in at around 3% is effectively barely keeping up with inflation. So it's not really an investment strategy. And for if you had been an investor in GICs over the last market cycle, you have grossly underperformed the marketplace. So trying to compare apples to fish is you know never a real thing. But I'm also keenly aware that you know after prolonged periods of volatility and uncertainty that you know people get tired um so this is understandable um given the volatility we've seen lately you know last year was the worst year for a prudent balance investor since the great financial crisis we grossly outperformed our benchmarks by being overweight energy um you know having an underweight to the technology stack and you know it was a year to celebrate in relative terms but you know, i'm very and it's something many of you have heard me saying direct conversations and client meetings, you know, while I'm respective that relative performance does not, you know, pay the bills, uh, it's important not to be, you know, stuck behind the eight ball, so to speak, and, you know, be so far away from our goals. So, you know, last year was a year of capital preservation with modest losses and modest gains, you know, and this year, uh, again, pretty choppiness, but at the same time, the news cycle was focusing on two very bifurcated parts of the market. We've seen banking sector get smashed. And then we've seen things like technology, AI, um, chip manufacturers, uh, technology stocks go to the moon again. So, but listen, it's crucial um, for investors to anchor themselves in the, in the core principles of investing. First and foremost, you know, staying invested, you know, is the key. Um, timing the markets consistently is difficult and often futile task. And historically, markets have shown an upward trajectory over the long term, despite short term fluctuations. By staying invested, investors have the opportunity to benefit from this long-term trend. I always talk about, you know, the chart of the S&P or the TSX or whatever benchmark you want to use. Um, you know, the, you know, if you dissect and look at a short period of time, and we're talking about investing over lifetimes and over market cycles, is that you know, if you look at, you know, the, the closer and the shorter down you get, if you extrapolate it, you know, they're, they're violent wild rides across the marketplace. The further you know you step back from um, the chart, the smoother it gets. It's kind of looking at uh, looking at a map uh, or the globe and expecting it to be round. Um, no, no insert comment around flat Earth whatsoever. But you know, the closer you get to the ground, you can see obviously 
trenches, valleys, mountains, rivers, you know, et cetera. So um, taking a long-term uh, long term view uh, is important. So having that long-term perspective rather than being swayed by short-term movements, it, it's important uh, for investors to understand that markets do go through cycles. There's ups and downs along the way, um, but by having a solid plan and sticking to it, investors can avoid these knee-jerk uh, reactions based on short-term market volatility. Um, a well-diversified portfolio aligned with risk tolerances and financial goals provides the foundation for the solid plan. You know, and the question is, is are there other strategies or practices investors should consider during challenging markets? Absolutely. Uh, in addition to staying invested and having a solid plan, uh, investors should practice discipline and avoid making impulsive decisions based on market noise. It's all too common. Yeah, at the bottom of the market, people want to sell and at the top of the market, people want to buy. Uh, but staying invested, having a solid plan, um, investors can weather the storms and position themselves for long term success. So with that kind of commentary and around the fatigue that we're well aware of, people are feeling it. Um, you know, I, I speak to investors all day long, um, but also, you know, counterparties, colleagues, uh, capital partners, uh, fund managers, et cetera. Um, people are getting tired of this. Uh, and that in itself, I, I view as a, a positive um, indicator. Uh, generally, it's, it's, it's at its worst at the end. Um, but I want to talk about something called the anatomy of a narrow equity market. Once again, we have seen a small subset of the market provide, you know, the bulk of returns that are dominating the marketplace. And these wild movements or standard deviation outsteps, um, they cause confusion, they cause frustration, um, but being broadly, broad invested and being broadly diversified, um, it's something we need to address. So. The narrowing of U.S. equity performance has been this hot topic so far this year. Uh, and what does this mean for investors when such a small handful of stocks make up such a huge percentage of markets overall returns? So some key statistics to help explain the extreme nature of this phenomenon and where opportunities and risks may lie in the future as markets eventually normalize over time. So not all things being equal, one of our favorite ways to gauge the effect of narrowing market leadership and what I mean by narrowing market leadership is, you know, if you've got Tesla, Facebook, Amazon, Google, you know, or, you know, NVIDIA, certain chip makers, you know, providing, you know, incredible movements, um, it'll drag the whole index higher, but yet the attribution or the bulk of the return is coming from a couple uh, erroneous events. Um, but to compare the performance of the S&P, which is weighted by market cap against the S&P equal weight index, where every company's performance effectively has the same vote. You know, the handful of large stocks outperforming the broader market uh, so dramatically in recent months has had a much larger weight representation in the former than in the latter, which in turn means the gains um, make up a greater percentage of the S&P's overall gains than they do for its equal weighted counterpart. And moreover, the better these large cap perform in relation to the rest of the S&P, the greater the weighting becomes. So it's a self-fulfilling pro prophecy, um, kind of like the Nortel effect. Um, indeed, indeed, and I'm going to provide a bunch of charts, you know, along with, I'm not going to embed and share the screen, um, but I've got a chart showing the positive spread between the two indexes um, was larger at the end of May than it has been at any time this century. So the performance spread between the S&P and its equal weighted where all companies are treated equally has never been this wide. So it's a you typically it's it's fairer to say um, that it's unlikely over the long term that one or two things um, can stay you know, uh, as as robust as they are. So size matters, um, but sectors matter more. Uh, there's little doubt that market market leadership has narrowed as a result of a select few large cap stocks vastly outperforming the broader market. But it seems the phenomenon has been driven more by sector preferences than size. So while the largest names in communication services, IT, have vastly outperformed the S&P, um, that isn't the case in other sectors. Um, you know, banking got, has been crushed year to date. Um, large, you know, so large caps have underperformed in eight of the 11 sectors analyzed and underperformed the equal weighted index in four. So effectively, there are only of, of all the JIC sectors, we're talking consumer discretionary, real estate, energy, materials, financials, consumer services, consumer staples, 
utilities, IT, industrials, and healthcare, all of the JIC sectors, which make up an exposure to the broader economy uh, of the marketplace, only three of them have performed well. Um, so unless you were all in, um, you know, if you were all in on uh, IT, you had a great year, much like last year. If you were all in on energy, you had a phenomenal year. You know, our job is to overweight and underweight sectors where we see economic leadership. And I'll get to kind of not so much a punchline, but a bit of an explanation. So we avoided calamity last year by being deep value, by being pragmatic and avoiding stocks with unrealistic um, earnings per share valuations, PE ratios, et cetera. Um, and then this year, um, growth has taken off and value has uh, has has struggled um, as everyone is, you know, we are in a recessionary environment, a recessionary trade, and you know, these global growth type names have, have lagged um, while people have flocked back to technology stocks. So, you know, are we ready for a reversal? The disparity in U.S. equity performance that is evident uh, across differently weighted equity indexes and across different sectors can also be seen at an industry level, in particular gains in semiconductors, um, that has averaged in the, just in the three months, a 25% return, which represents a standard deviation or a shift from what you would typically see of almost three. It's 2.87. Um, I can get into it and, and impress everyone with some statistics and talk about and explain what standard deviation, but it's effectively the rate at which the dispersion of these returns happens over time. Um, so that, that's important. Conversely, some industries uh, underperformed much more than usual. Bank stocks, for instance, fell 24.99%, which is 2.54 standard deviations below what is normal relative to the S&P. Um, and machinery stocks fell around 17%, which is almost three uh, standard deviations below. So perhaps the most important aspect of this analysis, however, is the fact that Standard deviations greater than two, plus or minus, tend to be good inflection points that have historically resulted in reversals of relative performance, whereby laggards like banks and machinery could end up being relative leaders in the future, and current leaders like media and entertainment could become laggards. So granted, the you know, famous last words of an investor is this time it's different, um, but rarely do market extremes remain market extremes for long. And standard deviations have already begun to normalize in some instances this month, which has helped to broaden out the market, a sign of relative health that may, that many market participants will surely keep an eye on uh, and would likely welcome. So again, I'll insert a chart here later talking about, um, you know, the standard deviations as they breach that level of two, like banks, for example, um, being 2.54 standard deviations outside of band. Typically, the average historical return 12 months after this is 20%. So banks have hurt a lot of people. They might be the sector that comes rallying back. And conversely, um, semiconductors being 2.87 standard deviations outside their norm, historical average returns uh, after such a wide move up is minus 18%. So now, if I started a hedge fund today, long banks, short semiconductors might be a great topical trade, but I don't run a hedge fund. Kind of the third segment I wanted to talk about, and this is, you know, the economist me, and this will be probably, I think some of the, the so bear with me, um, you know, we're only 13 minutes in, so hopefully I can keep your attention for a little longer. Um, so this will be a lot of economic talk. Uh, we're going to talk about inflation, the cooling economy and how to uh, kind of, we see things. Um, so the, the progress in lowering inflation and slowing the pace of monetary tightening, particularly in the U.S., um, has improved equity and bond market returns over the last little bit after the poor performance uh, last year. However, the return to low inflation is yet to be fully realized, and it would be surprising for it to be achieved without greater weakness in the economic activity seen so far. Like I've said, we expect the markets to be good in the back half of the year, but the economic data and the news cycle would be terrible. Job loss needs to happen. So we remain cautious about equity returns in the near term. Interest rates likely need to rise further, uh, but probably at most only moderately more and also could be lowered at some point to ease policy. So we're getting to that top of the cycle. Um, so fixed income returns should 
remain more reasonable. And so we continue to advocate a tactical underweight position in equities and overweight fixed income and asset allocation. Now, across core portfolios, we did have exposure in the front half of the year to the NASDAQ um, through our US uh, exposure and equity models. Um, we took that exposure to zero last week. You know, that market is up 30% year to date. Um, now, year to date means nothing because last year it would have been decimated. Um, so, you know, picking your spots is important. So, with the you know with interest rates having ratcheted up this fast and the economy cooling down, you know that huge trade up I don't think is sustainable, and we expect uh, you know some turbulence, especially through the through the summer. So, we've raised cash tactically and taken profits in that part. Um, so, making progress. Uh, after last year's challenging markets um, is bad for balanced re fund returns as during the great financial crisis. It's something I've talked about before. Uh, and, you know, and for from a decade and a half earlier, this was the worst uh, balanced investors could have seen. So uh, this year is producing more positive outcomes, but it's not top right yet. Uh, progressing in lower inflation has indeed been quite encouraging, you know, attributed at this stage mostly to the easing of supply uh, constraints and commodity prices. A uh, couple podcasts ago, I talked about, you know, that core inflation has not, you know, coming down has nothing to do with all the great things the Democrats are doing, um, you know, or our liberal government here in Canada. Um, it has to do with the fact that supply chains, you know, as start, largely started working. So cost of inputs and uh, materials has come down um, and brought down inflation with it. Um, but we would like to see more cooling of labor markets and slowing of wage growth which is still higher than consistent with inflation returning to target. So some rise in unemployment to ease wage pressures still seems likely, perhaps similar to in the moderate recessions in the US in the early 90s and early 2000s. And higher employment typically has been accompanied by lower profit margins and earnings for companies. So whether the Fed must raise rates further remains to be seen as rates are already quite high. Um, but moreover, the level of rates uh, has in the past generally been constrained enough to generate a rise in unemployment to cool labor market over the ensuing year or two. So it's just a matter of time before this occurs. Um, another consideration is the risk of credit crunch. You know, after the U.S. bank failures in March and April, typically in a slowing economy, lending standards are tightened and loan officers at banks in the U.S. reported in early April that this had been happening, but it remains unclear how much further conditions may have tightened since then. Given the potential significant impact on the US economy, a credit crunch could require easier monetary policy and lower interest rates than otherwise, in contrast to the upside risks of interest rates. So yeah, it's a delicate balance. You can tighten things, you know, when you tighten a screw too much, eventually, you know, something breaks. And we saw that uh, as banks in the US um, failed. Um, these additional considerations also highlight the challenges in setting policy appropriately and potential for policy mistakes and the risk of a harder landing for the economy and a sharp correction again in equities in the period ahead, which cautiousness at present might help protectors from uh, protect investors from uh, if it were to unfold. So, you know, there's we're at a pretty critical time um, if interest rates continue you know, to rise. Um, something will break. Um, if they pause and we kind of hold here, um, corporate earnings are going to weaken. There will be more job loss. Um, the economy will naturally cool from inflation, and then we can get into an easing uh, perspective. If we go through a very violent period where they do hike uh, again and it causes other things to break and they have to quickly pivot to cuts, I think it's it's kind of my worst case scenario because the things that are going to take off are things that generally um, you know don't make up a larger portion uh, of deep value um, long term position portfolios around creating uh, capital preservation, uh, modest growth in income. It'll be tech stocks that go crazy again. And investors have called Powell's rate bluff so far and bet on growth stocks. So this is that kind of last part um, that I wanted to discuss. And this is the disparity between value and growth. So whereby value kept us, you know, out of the penalty box last year, um, this year growth has dominated um, the theme, you know, the NASDAQ, you know, the difference between the NASDAQ and the Dow, which would be, you know, for all intents and purposes, call it 
high growth, crazy things versus old world safe businesses with great balance sheets. Um, you know, call it Tesla versus GE or Johnson and Johnson. Um, so, you know, the background to this is that a shift in market expectations toward the Fed's monetary easing has bolstered investor confidence in the U.S., leading to a resurgence in global growth. So the Nasdaq just closed its second best quarter. Um, and, you know, we've now traded that position off and taking a bit of breather. Um, but the issue is, you know, the Fed has raised interest rates nine times in a row, uh, indicating that further rate hikes are possible. And this move shows central bank is confident that its efforts to quell inflation won't exasperate an emerging banking crisis. So reading into that, we, you're going to see more hikes. Um, Chair Jerome Powell and others have said that their priority remains in taming inflation, um, but traders are betting otherwise. A 25 basis point rate decrease is priced in by the Fed's July 26th meeting with the rate implied by Fed funds futures forecast to decline below four by the end of 23. I said earlier in the year, we might see a cut by the end of the year, but probably push those expectations out into the, you know, I would have said the front uh, quarter and then, you know, to be more conservative, you know, probably more for sure by the uh, first half of 2024. Um, so, you know, in March, this increasing probability um, led to a surge in growth stocks, particularly in the tech sector, which offers longer payback periods. I've talked to many of you about the idea of thinking everyone knows interest rates up, um, bond prices down. And typically you've seen in the media, you know, interest rates go up and tech stocks do bad. And people say, why? Well, call them like long duration equities. If everything comes down to the net present value of future cash flows or earnings in coming up with, you know, the perception of what we're willing to pay for an investment, a security, a business, uh, et cetera. Now, if I said, you know, I'm going to earn $1 per year for the next 10 years and interest rates are zero, whether I had $10 today or a dollar per day, 10 years, the, the net present value of all those cash flows is still 10. Now you put an interest rate higher, that dollar 10 years out from now is not the same. That risk-free rate of return comes into play. So the net present value of it becomes lower. Uh, and that's why these long duration, these tech stocks that have huge forecasts of huge earnings way out into the future that no one can see, you know, if a company is going to earn a bazillion dollars 10 years from now, if the inflation is zero, if the interest rates are zero, people are willing to pay a bazillion dollars, you know, for those earnings today. Um, so that's why you've seen this kind of, you know, jump back to uh, growth stocks. So, but many investors are considering what the likelihood of a hard landing on inflation would be for valuations. You know, if there are rate cuts, the beneficiaries could be tech uh, and other firms who cash flows lie further ahead. Um, so this shift from value to growth, um, you know, echoes some comments we've seen from other banks uh, in February um, saying the concern is that value will weaken this year as markets reprice back into a recession scenario. So we've seen that energy is down. Um, cyclical consumer, um, discretionary rates, staples, um, you know, anything with sensitivities to interest rates, um, while bond yields could reflect, reflect the risk of central banks, policy mistakes uh, with continued yield curve inversion. Um, you know, with that, you're such at a precipice where the, the whatever does happen will create a wide dispersion and volatility. Very comfortable, you know, in our positioning, you know, as such. And going into the summer, we're carrying a high degree of liquidity uh, to take advantage uh, of opportunities as we see market thematics become more clear. Um, this is going to be tough over voice, so I hope you know any of you who have access to reviewing the presentation. But the comparing the performance of growth versus value stocks on a year-to-date basis, this I think largely makes up where prudent investors that are invested for the long term, where they're kind of feeling a lot of that investor fatigue. Um, you know, you turn on CNBC or whatever, you know, source and it's, you know, you see NVIDIA, you know, up, uh, you know, up strong, you're like, oh, I might own NVIDIA, but I don't know a lot of it, or I don't own it. You know, these uh, wild chip semiconductor stocks or anything driven and being propelled by AI um, has gone, you know, crazy again. But the, the, again, comparing the performance of growth and value on a year to date basis. Um, so the global growth index uh, year to date 
um, is up 8%. And that's like companies like with, you know, effectively no earnings, uh, anything that has, you know, momentum based or hyper growth and forecasting. And then the value names that screen for robust balance sheets, distributable free cash flow, earnings per share, great businesses that you want to own forever. You know, the year to date performance of the global um, value stocks is minus 3.68. So you've got the dispersion between, you know, up eight and down three and a half. You know, that is a significant, that's 11.7% difference in return. And that's by being in value oriented names versus these hyper growth names. And it's things like GameStop again and Zoom and, you know, all these wild hyper growth uh, names that are, you know, driving for outside performance, anything with AI, et cetera. So, here we are, guys. I've used up a lot of your time. Um, I've covered a lot of material. Um, I will provide the kind of presentation to go along with it. And, but as always, you know, I think we had come back to our core principles in and around people, process, and philosophy. Um, but being respective and, and governing, you know, our own um, behaviors in and around volatility and fatigue within the marketplace will, will prove prudent. I'm excited about the back half of the year, um, not without, you know, more bumps along the way, um, but setting things up into 2024 where we do see, you know, more constructive and easing into the economy um, and new leadership and resurgence um, to the next structural bull market. Um, I know it, it, this is a saying that it's hard to say, uh, but you make all your money in a bear market. You just don't know it at the time. Um, so it's these positions and positioning and fortitude to stay invested. Um, that generally provide for long-term uh, results. Um, thank you so much for the time and tuning in. Uh, as always, if you have any comments or questions, um, please give myself or any member of MLD Wealth a call. Um, thank you so much and have a wonderful month.